Where do I find women that are down with polygyny? Bro, listen, you really think that they just congregating around like a bunch of women just all around? Like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm with polygyny. Oh, you know what? Me too. Let's hang out and go to the movies. Like, what? what? You're not going to find a place that women, I, I, at least a place that I know of, where women are just like, yeah, you know, I'm down with polygyny. Like, there's a community or a city or a certain area and stuff like that. No, not really. Those of you whom I have not had the pleasure to meet just yet, uh, my name is Coach Nadir. I am one of the founders of Outstanding Personal Relationships, where I am married to two women. Uh, currently, Coach Fatima for over 27 years, and I've been practicing polygyny for a little over 12, as I've been married to Coach Nyla now for just over uh, 12 years. And what we've done is we've decided to share some of the wisdom, some of the, the challenges, and some of the best practices when it comes to practicing polygyny. All right. And I know some people might not be familiar with the word because the traditional word that we hear more often than not is the word polygamy. And polygyny is a form of polygamy, just to you know get some clarification out of the way, because we all know that words are powerful as I'm still sharing, <laughs> but polygamy means a person who is married to multiple spouses. That could mean a man married to multiple wives or a wife or a woman married to multiple husbands. But for specificity and for clarity's sake, um, polygyny means a man who has multiple wives. Polyandry means a woman who has multiple husbands. And then there's the other common term or the term is becoming a lot more common, which is a uh, Polyamory, that's people who have multiple lovers, doesn't necessarily mean that there are any marriages involved. That just means that people usually have agreements and so on and so forth, kind of open relationship, if you will, with a number of different agreements, with different people. So, yeah, doesn't necessarily fall under um, polygamy at all. Nevertheless, it is a, a form of poly relationship. Now, here's the thing. Let me go. I'm going to start right from the beginning. Um, again, I've been married for, in polygyny for a little over 12 years. Now, you see us three when we coach and stuff, if you have seen this, if you haven't, our uh, YouTube channel is Outstanding Personal Relationships, as well as our website and our private communities, OPRcommunity.com. So if you know, I usually have um, Coach Nyla sitting here, Coach Fatsum sitting here, we may train together, do different things together, or you might just see them two talking and, and speaking together. However, what you see today, I will consider our chapter 12. All right, if I look at our marriages chapters, and the chapter 12 is much different from our chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I mean, imagine this, you're going to see a movie, right? You're really excited about this movie and you go in the movie in the beginning, everything is happy. Everything is going good in the middle of the movie. Everything is happy. Everything is going good. And at the end of the movie, everything is happy. It's going good. And you, you're you going to leave the movie disappointed. Like, what's the point of that, right? Really, you know, there's usually an epic tale, you know, in the beginning there was, or, you know, let's start here and blah, blah, blah. There's tragedy, there's triumph, there's ups and downs. That's the drama of life. That's the drama of life. So in life, you know, wherever you come in and meet someone at, we don't know their backstories. So I'm sharing that with you just to let you know what you see now and today and how we're putting things together is a result of what we are sharing with you. OK, because there, think about it. How many other people that you know are bold enough and honest enough to share with you about polygyny to begin with, first of all? All right. When it's something that's considered taboo, there are other subjects and topics and alphabet letters and stuff that are more. Um, accepting and welcoming now to speak about where if you speak about them in a negative fashion, you might get banned, you may get censored, you'll get shunned, even though the silent majority wants to preserve the human race. But when we're talking about polygyny, which is simply an ancient form of marriage with much wisdom, it doesn't get talked about. And there's a lot of blame to go around there because I don't care what your religion is. I'm a Muslim. OK, so I practice uh, I practice Islam and I follow polygyny as taught to us by the final prophet, except Islam. So with that being said, if you have a challenge with that, I have to also ask you to, you know, problem with me being Muslim and stuff and practicing, uh, you know, Islamic polygyny, if you will, polygyny according to Islam. Actually, you know, 
what's what would be the problem with that in your mind you know I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are probably some muslims that you don't have a problem with them being muslim and you like and you, and you know they, they make a lot of sense so if you like malcolm malcolm x el hajj malik al shabazz rahimahullah he was muslim or muhammad ali the greatest muslim or maybe other muslims you want to know today um let's say shaquille o'neal or one of my favorite comedians dave chappelle those are just just a couple or we can get into music artists you could talk about you know artists formerly known as loon or you could talk about uh lupe fiasco we can go on and talk about a number of different people who are muslims who are you know mainstream or celebrity or whatnot or they may practice you know some may be more uh devout in their practice or whatnot but the issue is not that we muslims the issue is that every single scripture if you are a scripture following individual or even many cultures I was I would argue to say uh, the vast majority have some form of polygyny or polygamy in history. I mean, my, monogamy is relatively new. And Nancy Cott really breaks that down. She's a Ph.D. professor at, at Harvard in her book, Public Vows. But. My challenge is. That. If the people who are supposed to be educating us, if the people who know throughout their scripture whether that's in the, the torah the old testament for example or even the new testament or the Injil, or you're talking about the quran or you're talking about other scriptures all of them have some type of form of polygyny how come our leaders aren't teaching us about about it well because it's not popular because some people don't like it because they don't want to get hell at home so what has become much more easy is this other form even more acceptable sad to say um of cheating in infidelity now, that doesn't mean, oh, you either have an or you just have cheating. No, that's not the point. The point is that all of these things should be taught or should be educated on. And if our religious leaders and scholars and whatnot know that this is the, is the point, then they should be providing practical information because they know that polygyny still happens. Whether they like it or not, whether it's done right or not. The challenge is, how are you going to learn how to do something right if no one is teaching you and putting it out there? Hence, we formed, again, outstanding first relationships. So that's how we got there. That's kind of the, the preface of where we're going to get to at the beginning. Now, I'm going to talk about underestimating and overestimating. So here, here, here we go. I get brothers that approach me all the time. They ask questions like, you know what? You know, should I get married first or should I not? Or you know what? I met this this um, sister and, you know, she's real cool, wants to get married. My, my wife is on board with polygyny already. She already knows when I got married. Then I get those say she doesn't know. But, you know, as I've grown, I've done this, got established. I want to expand the family. All of these different things, right? The very first thing a man has to ask himself and really understand is, am I equipped? Am I able where I currently am to practice polygyny now, as of today? Am I good? Am I equipped? Then, of course, you got to ask the questions that go with that, right? What does being equipped mean? What does that look like? Matter of fact, what does it look like? Usually we get to the, can I, find, can I handle it financially? Yes, that's absolutely a piece. Can I handle it financially? Can I take care of an extra woman, an extra family? Can I build it? Am I going to be able to provide her with her own stuff? You know, I prefer the, the again, the Islamic model, Islamic way is each woman have their own homes. So am I, one, able to provide that? Am I financially astute? Is it what that comes to? What's my baseline? Now, anybody can desire and want what they want and have their own preferences. Let me make that clear, especially for any women that may be watching. I'd be thinking, well, he doesn't have this, but he wants this. So what? Listen, you could be driving to Corolla right now and still want a Bentley. There's nothing wrong with wanting or desire. But there's still an ability to have some ambition and to strive for something. So I can't get on anybody with what they want, like, or prefer. But what I can let you know is to take inventory of yourself. Are you qualified right now? If you're not qualified right now, that's not necessarily a problem unless you're trying to act on it right now while you're unqualified. This leads to problems. This goes to overestimating your ability. This goes to what um, things that we see that are relatively common. So, for example, you get some people that say, you know what, uh, I, I want to have a baby because, you know, as babies, they, they may have some trauma and things that they've experienced in life. We all go through our things. Right. And one of the common things I get, especially when working with uh, at at risk youth and so on, of which I used to be one. Um, girls would say, you know what, these different things have happened and so on. Nobody loves me and everything else. But if I have a baby, that baby's going to love me and depend on me and everything else. So they won't go ahead and have a baby by somebody who's a deadbeat, a bum or what have you, not getting married, anything else. And they think that this baby is going to be, that's going to solve their problem of loneliness and fill this void. No, it's not. Not at all. That baby is an independent individual that's going to be striving for independence until they reach that age. Okay. So similarly, 
marrying somebody else or deciding or moving on polygyny, like, you know what? That's going to give me the ambition to build because I know I'm going to have to take care of another woman. No, bro, it's backwards. That's all the way back asswards. Getting yourself together and working on yourself first is the most important part because then the next question goes to, you know what? Where do I find women that are down with polygyny? Bro, listen, you really think that they just congregating around like a bunch of women just all around like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm with polygyny. Oh, you know what? Me too. Let's hang out and go to the movies. Like, what? what? You're not going to find a place that women, I, I, at least a place that I know of where women are just like, yeah, you know, I'm down with polygyny. Like there's a community or a city or a certain area and stuff like that. No, not really. You know, quite the opposite, especially with social, you know, social conditioning, social constructs, the way they're set up right now. However, what you will find, what you will find is that women are attracted to men who are strong men. Not just physically strong. I'm not talking about physically, which you should be physically strong regardless. Um, you, you can't be getting, you should be physically strong. Let's leave it at that. All right, that's a part of it, right? It's part of your manhood. But there are certain qualities that are attractive, which means they attract. Similar to magnets, you have magnets that repel, you have some that attract, right? And there are preferences and characteristics that women put above necessarily your looks. You don't have to be the best looking man, you can be an average looking, even a below average man, but have certain characteristics of confidence, your, your financial acumen is there, your intelligence. These basic things are attractive, attractive, meaning that you forming and building yourself will attract, all right? Doesn't matter if you're married. It doesn't. In our society today, there are many people, there are women who are putting people up on game about how to mess around with married men. They prefer married men. It's immoral as hell, yes. But it's a whole thing. All right? And to believe it's not is naive. When you think about groupies, who are they? I haven't really seen a bunch of male groupies, you know, yelling and screaming at a Beyonce concert and trying to just not nah, groupies and, and so on. The whole thing, ball or alert. We know what it is in society. But the point is becoming a more attractive man and what that looks like. So, of course, you know, your financial acumen is part of it. But women don't hang out. You have to attract women. Now, that doesn't mean you just sit back and just, you know, work on these certain skills. And if you don't know, like on the bottom of your screen right now, uh, if you want to get the ebook I just released, it's a polygamy roadmap for men. This is the one that's for men. There's also one that my wives did for women. But if you go to polygamyroadmap.com, you break it down, put down five requisites that are very important when it comes to practicing polygamy and building yourself up before you even make that move. If you don't know how to give yourself a report card or be objective and disassociate from your emotions and think you will think you Superman, you think you just ready. Someone shows some interest in you and you're already married. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, that's what's, oh, you know what? OK, you keep working and this one won't have to work and we'll do this. And you think that they're not going to have a problem or she's not going to have a problem with that. You know, maybe initially it may not be an issue, but are you the type of man when they say you need to be more than twice the man to practice polygyny? Is that you? Because what I'm getting is. You know what, bro? You know, uh, there's a sister that's really interested in stuff like that. So I went ahead and got married. You know, she's working. She's doing all this. And I haven't told my wife and stuff yet. But, you know, I'm trying to work on getting my money and da da da. Okay, cool. Here's the thing. First of all, no, that's not cool. But here's the thing this has already happened. So, what are you doing regarding your leadership and your emotional aptitude? How are you able to, or are you able to, communicate effectively? So that now, instead of stonewalling, instead of shutting down, instead of getting defensive, you're able to say, look, we have to have this difficult conversation. Oh, well, I talk about all the time about having hard conversations. Me, I'm an introvert. I'm speaking to you because I have, um, I would have appreciated some information and guidance like this about a dozen years ago before I got involved, a little over a dozen years ago before I got involved in religion. But I have a responsibility to the community to share some wisdom as these, these hairs get a little more gray. <laughs> so are you able to have that difficult conversation? Me, I didn't want to do that. I'd rather practice avoidance. I don't like conflict. If I get upset and something like that, you know, I don't like that. I don't like these feelings of me getting vulnerable on certain things and not, or having to hear somebody mouth and they whining, but you're trying to take care of them, been taken care of. That's a very difficult conversation to have. If it's someone that you love, and usually you love your wife, you're already married in monogamy, you love your wife, you've been with her, she has expectations, all these different things are shared, right? It's not easy to necessarily have a conversation. If you're not able to have a conversation, 
things are going to be very difficult. But what are you doing to work on this? See, one of the things that women like, you know, they think that men don't have emotions, right? Because we don't really share them often. And our sharing doesn't look like yours. Can you imagine that a man is built with the same type of emotional structure as a woman? Imagine when it's time to battle, you have your sword out, you're on the battlefield, and, and you think it's time to have a discussion. Now, diplomacy is supposed to happen before getting to war. Diplomacy is supposed to happen before that. You have to be able to bury that because that's seen as a weakness. And I'm just talking about bare bones facts when it comes to that person who's supposed to provide and protect. He's supposed to be out there and be vicious. And a man should be an absolute monster against his enemies. That has to be able to be built up or should be able to be built up in you. And what that looks like in modern times and just this modern times where, you know, there's drones going on, different types of war stuff happening, happening. That looks like Sundays. That looks like Sundays, any given Sunday right now during football season. So during football season, that even watching um, football, it's not only a testosterone thing, but it not only builds your testosterone is what I mean, but you get to see this. You get to see if you ever been around a man. I remember being around my father when I was young, single digits, watching football together and stuff like that and get excited and all the way up and yelling and so on and so forth. That's man stuff. All right, that's man. That's the closest that most people will get to a real battle. All right, being able to take somebody down, knock them out, hit them hard, all that kind of stuff. All right, at least American football. All right, the rugby and all the rest of that stuff on the other side of the planet, maybe. But I'm giving it just that example. Can you imagine, you know, you're there. You are you have to get something done. There's this other person standing in your way and you want to talk it out. And you just want to share how you feel about something. It's not going to work. We're different. And it's okay. We're supposed to be different. But as a man, we have to be able to feel safe enough and good enough and important enough to be able to share some information, let you know what it is. And then we have to be smart enough to know how to deal with reactions and responses. I get brothers that are like, look, man, I don't care. I'm just going to do such and such and blah, blah, blah. She's going to have to deal with it one way or the other. Okay, I hear what you're saying, bro. I hear what you're saying. But the fact of the matter is the reason you haven't told her something because you know it would hurt her. All right, it would likely hurt her in many marriages. Some women already get about it from the jump, but those aren't the ones that are having challenges um, with talking about or at least discussing plans with polygyny. So if it's going to hurt her because you love her, clearly you don't want to hurt her. You need to protect her and provide for her. But how do you open up and have this type of conversation? How do you get to the real and say what it is? Because one of the first things is why? Why do you want to? Why do you want somebody else? Am I not enough? And they go, it can go to extremes, right? It has nothing to do with it. It's really the way we're built. You know, you could be the great. You could be. <laughs> you could be people's dream women, dream a uh, dream woman. I don't care who you are. You're watching this right now. You can probably think in the last couple of few weeks, uh, Nia Long, a lot of people like her, right? They just think she's the bomb for whatever reason, you know, you know, whatever. She's not married to a guy who cheated on her. So this is a whole big scandal. All the, like, first of all, you're not even married. You don't even have that commitment. So my guy, I think he's Nigerian. He cheats on her with a married woman. This is a Mormon. They just released her name um, with married women, right? So he cheated on her with at least two women. That were part of the, the Celtic staff. It, you know, it was already well known, but they want to get rid of the man. Anyway, forget the politics. The point is, this is Nia Long, and people are like, how could you cheat on Nia Long? Dude, Nia Long is not a Beyonce. <laughs> Did Beyonce get cheated on? I mean, come on. You got Lemonade and 444, two albums that came from that experience, if you will. So it's not the woman. It's not like, oh, you're his everything. You could never be his everything. He could never be your everything. All right, so we got to get out of that mindset, first of all, and be real with each other. But at the same time, this person that you're married to, that you're talking about you're going to provide and protect for, you, you're concerned that she's going to feel hurt. But how do you deal with that as a man? What are you doing to increase your emotional aptitude? What are you reading? What are books are you listening to? What courses are you taking? You know, what questions are you asking? Are you like me and you're an introvert? Where if somebody gets to talking, they got about 30 to 45 seconds to get to it. Or else I'm going in my mind somewhere else. Or I've thought about it 20 different ways in my mind. And I've evaluated all these different prospects, all these different things, and I'm ready to give a solution. But many times when women are speaking, they don't want to get a solution. They want to feel heard. So do you know that? And are you allowing them to feel heard? Now, this is not the type of video either. This is not them, one of them busted videos by um, like DJ, a lot of people's favorite uh, simp 
uh, Derek Jackson, and I, I say simp in the fullest sense of the term, where you're just going to get on there and talk about the men and men haven't done this and women. Oh, you do so much. and You're so great. And da da da. And forget polygamy and yada yada. Monogamy is the bomb. And then he's cheating on his other wife. He's cheating on his wife and, you know, getting people pregnant and all kind of crazy. This, this ain't that. That's the uh, version of a male pick me, if you will. I'm being real speaking to the men because if I'm not going to call you out, who's going to do it? Usually your religious leader is not even going to talk about religion. He may have plenty of girlfriends, people on the side. I'm being real. I don't care if you're a Jesse Jackson and you got babies on the side that come out because now you want to run for political office or you're a Herschel Walker, you know, which is currently in the news <laughs> where <laughs> you want to run for office. And guess what? Your illegitimate bastards come out and get used against you. You know, we can go on and on about people in, in positions of power, men in particular, whether it's the Bill uh, Bill Clintons, it's the Bill Gates. We can go on and on and on about this thing. Or Pastor Jimmy Swagger, or we talking about Muslims. You got Tariq Ramadan. We have a whole bunch of people. You got Pastor John Gray. They're all over the place. But here's the thing. Polygyny makes you responsible for your pleasures. So you have to understand something. Monogamy is not there to protect women, it's to protect men. You have one legitimate wife legitimate others are bastards if you have other children so you are only responsible for this right here let me make you feel comfortable or comforting but it requires you to be more of a man when you practice polygyny because there are additional responsibilities that you have to handle as a man so taking inventory do i have my money up what's my money game looking like how am i dealing with things emotionally these are the two biggest challenges and issues that you're going to face in marriage to begin with, even in monogamy. But in monogamy, you only have one other person, so you can have that struggle love and struggle together, do whatever you want to do. But when it comes to polygyny, there's a higher bar that must be met. And when you qualify for that, meaning that, yes, you are emotionally intelligent, you, you're striving, you get your money and stuff together and everything else, that becomes that much more attractive. It does. So what are you doing now? What are the last five books you read? What have you read on leadership, team building, building culture? How do you want it to look? What's the vision that you have for your family? Are you building on legacy or you just want to collect women? Because they're those men too. You know, the predators. Those who want to prey on you. Not pray with you. If you understand what I'm saying. So they look at women as prey. So they have a revolving door of 15, 20, 30 wives. You know, married for a month, two weeks, six months, so on. So what are we doing? And if we aren't doing, meaning you're in the you're in motion, you're already taking action, then that's a problem. You could think about polygyny, you could fantasize about polygyny, all of that stuff, whatever. But the fact is, what are you currently doing and working on? Because your life is capped. I meant to bring, get this. Yeah, put in my office. All right, it's an hourglass, right? Your life is like that hourglass. Time is already passed. You can't go back and get it. There's only a limited amount left. How much more time are we going to waste? See, I, I meant um, a brother had mentioned some stuff, and I said, you know, you have to be man enough to practice polygyny. And he's like, man enough? Like, what does that mean? And you know, how insulting is this? I'm like, bro, I was answering a question um, that was posted by a brother. And he got all offended. I'm like, bro, you, you got to be man enough to handle it. We were talking about the risk or your provisions. And your risk, your, your provisions are limited. It is what it is. It's already limited. However much you're going to make in your lifetime is already known. It's, that's already set. Now, we don't know that amount, but a lot of other does. It is what it is. That doesn't mean you don't try. You don't take effort. But it does mean that if you ain't taking effort, you shouldn't be even trying to pursue something that requires more of you be, for fear of failing. Because there's a serious responsibility with family. For me, my family consists of 12 children. Now, some of these children are adults, okay? But still, from us three came 12 children. 10 are biologically mine. I have two bonus children. So children ranging from 27 years old down to four. That's a serious range. But what I wanted to do is change my entire life, and I had this vision of how things were going to go. I didn't know or wasn't even intending on practicing polygyny when I first got married. It didn't know anybody that practiced it. You know, that wasn't even on my mind. I just wanted to make sure I was right. I had this new religion, this new life and so on. I wanted to build and move in a certain direction. I was married 15 years before I chose to practice religion. And it wasn't an easy transition. So the two things I gave you, one, what are you doing so far as your money? 
If you haven't already watched and studied The Hidden Secrets of Money by Mike Maloney, why not? I've been talking about it for a while. If you're brand new, if this is your first time, welcome. Hosha Gale Dennis, Ahlan Wasahlan. All right. So, Hidden Secrets of Money. If you haven't at least got the number one financial uh, selling book of all time, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and dug into Robert Kiyosaki's works, why not? Get the audiobook free on YouTube. I suggest, I like physical books better, but you got to go audiobooks, it's good too. Getting the information and being able to implement it is what matters. Play the game, cash flow quadrant or cash flow 101, and then more advanced 202. Because he talks about the markets right now. When markets are going down, that's the time to build and create wealth. When it goes up, everybody looks good and looks like geniuses. But only those who are intelligent, sophisticated investors make money when it's going down. So even though it looks red, looks red you still can make green or go. But that's a different topic. Then again, what are you doing on your emotional end? How are you leading? If you're not in John C. Maxwell, come on, why not? Whether it's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership or any of his other leadership books or communication books, why not? Then we come to, okay, let's say you are in those places. Excellent. Are you communicating with other people who are already successful in these different areas you look to be? See, one of my mentors told me a long time ago, and I understand it now. Understand it now. Now, before I forget, I need to say lagging measure so I remember it. Makes it much easier, but it's a lagging measure. So my mentor told me, listen, if you look at success, however you, however you gauge it, there are three things that are going to help you better than anything else. And I found this to be true. He said, you know, the books that you read, he said, the books that you read. So I don't care if you're talking about books or audio books or courses, or whatever. The books that you read will make a difference five years. Again, we underestimate what can happen in five years, but overestimate what can happen in one. But in five years, the books you read will have a big impact on you. One of the most deep impacts on you, most profound, the books that you read. Two, the audios you listen to. The audios that you listen to. What are you listening to? Are you listening to, you know, music? Just waste your time, bubble gum for your ears? Or you listen to people that have more wisdom than you and they're dropping new concepts and ideas on you where you wish you could sit at somebody's foot and learn from those who already been there and done that because they have many of these are audio books, audio courses. What are you listening to? So he said the books you read, the audios you listen to. And the third thing are the people that are in your circle, the people you hang around. Are they lifting you up? Are they helping you expand your vision? Or are they choking it? 